Good afternoon, everyone. It is time to get started with Dino's webinar. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us today for full steam ahead into the maker movement. I hope everyone's having a great Wednesday. Um, before we dive into the webinar, just a little background on Dino for those of you who aren't familiar with Dino. Um, Dino is a classroom management solution that helps teachers defeat device distractions and helps students stay on task in digital environments with one to one devices in the classroom. Um, so as an ed tech partner to thousands of educators, tech coaches, and administrators, we have the resources to help guide your student device program in the right direction, which is why we team up with educators every month for a webinar to help educate you on new initiatives in um, student device programs and help you uh, make those better. So today's webinar will be recorded um, and we will make the recording available to everyone after the event. Feel free to share it with any teachers or technology people in your district or school who you think uh, would benefit from this webinar. And we will also have live Q&A. Um, so if you see in the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A button. Um, feel free to go ahead and submit questions throughout the webinar. Um, if you have anything that uh, you think either of us could answer, and we will take those questions at the end and answer them. Um, so today we will be talking about the maker movement and how to implement maker spaces in K-12 STEAM initiatives. Um, what you'll learn today, we hope, is what considerations go into planning the maker space movement, um, how to acquire the resources and funding needed for a successful maker space, and how to collaborate with teachers and infuse curriculum standards into the maker space. So today I'm joined by Chris Smolin from Lenore City Schools. He is a CTO there and has been a Dino customer for a while. Um, Chris, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. As you, as you said, Chris, Chris Smolin, uh, Chief Technology Officer for Lenore City Schools. We are a small school district in East uh, Tennessee. Three schools, one elementary, one middle, and uh, one high school. And uh, today I'll be uh, discussing a little bit about what we do with our library media centers and maker spaces in those environments. Uh, and, and what types of things you can apply to each uh, set of those grade levels uh, throughout the school system. Um, we've, we've been um, part of the maker movement now for probably uh, four or five years and that has evolved and changed drastically over the years. So uh, anyway. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that you can see us fully. Um, so why don't we go ahead and dive into the maker space. So Chris, can you tell me what exactly is the makerspace and how do we define that? Sure, so makerspaces, uh, we, we found all kinds of different definitions out there for uh, what a makerspace uh, actually is. A lot of people define that as a, a cart, you know, with uh, uh, some tangible objects uh, that, that students can tinker and play with. Some people uh, define it as uh, robotics, uh, laser cutting, uh, more fab uh, fabrication tools. Uh, we really started our journey into the maker movement with, with a quote uh, um, that kind of kind of goes like this. It says, our, our lab, uh, library should transition to places to do stuff, not simply places to get stuff. Uh, the library will become a laboratory in which community members tinker, build, learn, and communicate. Uh, we need to stop being the grocery store or candy store and become the kitchen. We should emphasize hospitality, comfort, convenience, and create work environments that invite exploration and creativity both virtually and physically. And I guess the key part of that statement is we wanted to quit being the grocery store at our library media centers. Uh, we were very traditional at one point in time. Um, teachers would bring students in to check out books in, in those libraries. And uh, once we became a one-to-one -one school district and, and we had a lot of uh, digital tools available to us, we found that fewer and fewer people were doing that. They could check books out uh, uh, online in their classrooms. Uh, so we, we wanted to, to create a different space uh, in those library uh, media centers. Uh, so we, we kind of started diving into the maker movement because of all that. Awesome. So what kind of considerations would you say go into planning the maker environment? Sure. Uh, so uh, we, we kind of break it down in, into several different considerations. Uh, what are the goals of, of the maker space? And I guess what I mean by that is, uh, you know, are we wanting to focus on engineering challenges, um, creativity, uh, give, give, give kids a space to become creative, um, uh, 
learn more about electronics, um, robotics, uh, digital fabrication tools that they typically wouldn't be exposed to in the, uh, uh, the normal typical classroom, um, exposure to different content uh, outside the normal scope of their curriculum, um, or whether you want to make it a, a, just a place to hang out uh, where, where kids can tinker and play before or after school. Uh, all those kind of uh, considerations came in, in into uh, how we were crafting what we do. Um, are there uh, resources available within the district? We, we wanted to look at that initially and we found that a lot of people uh, that we speak to uh, about this movement, they don't know where to start. They don't, uh, they often tell us that they don't have a lot of money. Uh, so uh, what, in, in considering that, uh, what things are already available to you? Uh, maybe you have robotics clubs uh, that meet before or after school and you can borrow the robots during the day. Uh, maybe you have a, a wood shop uh, either at your, uh, your, your middle school environment or maybe you have a partner high school that has a wood shop where you can uh, can take some uh, uh, surplus supplies uh, f uh, from them, uh, uh, things that maybe they wouldn't be using anymore. Uh, at our elementary and middle schools, we actually sent home uh, newsletters to, to, to parents. And in the newsletter, uh, we asked if there were uh, components maybe at home that uh, students uh, weren't using anymore. For example, uh, at the middle school level, you know, they may not be playing with their Legos at, at home anymore and parents kind of want to clean the house out. Uh, would, would you consider donating those uh, to the school? And so we got a lot of things like that. Um, we found that, uh, you know, a lot of our parents wo work at uh, local industries and we were able to kind of leverage that. Uh, we have one industry uh, which actually brings us truckloads of uh, styrofoam, cardboard, uh, different recyclables uh, that they have in stock from, uh, you know, boxing or, or things like that that they have uh, left over after they open uh, things there. Um, and then the local cafeteria, we have kids who go down to uh, our cafeteria after they, uh, you know, have shipments and, and they empty the boxes. Uh, we get things from them uh, as well. So, uh, uh, a lot of different ways to get cardboard uh, to start with uh, and, and then recyclables. Uh, and another thing that we really do consider is physical space. Um, in, in, the, in the beginning, we were in a, a smaller area and we had difficulty with large uh, uh, ongoing projects. So, so think about, um, uh, you know, are, are you going to do simple things that students can create within a day uh, and then um, uh, they're going to take them home or are you going to be uh, doing class rotations into the makerspace environment where students may be working on something for several weeks uh, and then depending upon how large those projects are physically, uh, that would define what kind of space uh, uh, you need. Uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, I, I said we were a one-to-one -one school district. Uh, every kid has a has a laptop and a lot of our resources are online. We've been moving our libraries more to digital uh, books. Uh, you know, the dog can't eat that. Uh, students can't lose the, the library book if it's digital. Uh, so about probably 60% uh, of the shelving in, in the, the physical library is available now um, as we've purged uh, physical books uh, out of that location. Uh, so, so we have that uh, available to us just to kind of store things and then some large storage areas in the back of the library as well. Um, scheduling, um, that's, that's another consideration. Um, we have three different schools in elementary, middle and a high school and we have three different types of schedules. So at the elementary, uh, our makerspace teachers only see those kids uh, once a week because they're on a rotation. So really they can't do really long-term projects because they're seeing a different group of kids every day. In our middle school environment, uh, we have nine week terms there. So those uh, students who are flowing through the makerspace in that area, they have, uh, have a long time that they can work on something. So about 50 kids you know, per class period are coming into that environment. Um, but we uh, uh, were kind of able to handle that and do some, some bigger projects with them. And at the high school, it's kind of drop in as you want to. Uh, we don't have uh, classes who are actually coming into the makerspace environment, but they're dropping in to hang out in the mornings, the afternoons, and throughout the day uh, during periods which, where they may be off. Um, 
And then uh, really considering what your students are interested in, we do a Google uh, form every year where we uh, show uh, the students some pictures uh, of some different uh, activities and kind of ask them what they would be interested in. And then uh, we collect that data and those are the things that we purchase uh, that year. Uh, students definitely need voice and choice uh, in the makerspace area. So then you talked about finding resources that are already available to you or the things that you can outsource for. What types of equipment are necessary for creating these maker spaces? Sure. Let me share my screen here. I have some, some photos of actually of what we do. Well, is it working for you? Not working for me. Uh, desktop one and share. How about that? Are we there? We are there. Um, not on your Slack deck though. How about that? There we are. Okay, sounds great. All right, so let's move through this. So at the elementary school, and this is kind of broken down into elementary, middle, and, and high school. So you can see we do a lot of coding and uh, you know, that, that's simple because it, it costs us zero dollars to log into uh, these free websites and code. So using a lot of Tinker and, uh, and Scratch, teaching kids how to uh, blockly code. One of the things that we have tried to do, and we do have some spillover from elementary to middle and then from middle to high school, uh, but because we are a three school school district with, with one of those uh, schools in each grade band, we're able to kind of build on our makerspace environment as we, as we go uh, along. So we'll start them with very elementary things in the elementary school and then kind of progress to more difficult concepts as uh, students uh, age. Uh, a lot of robotics, uh, Dash and, uh, and, and Dot is very appropriate for uh, elementary school kids. They can drive the robot, they can program it with Blockly coding. Uh, but if you're in a high school environment, Dash and Dot and Q are actually hackable and you can actually use JavaScript programming or Python with those robots as, uh, as well. So they kind of run the gamut. Ozobots, if you're looking for a cheap little robot uh, that will teach, uh, uh, you know, students to uh, uh, be able to uh, think about uh, how robots work in industry with following lines on the floor, uh, how they can put down different uh, marks and, and actually create code without knowing HTML or even drinking, uh, drinking uh, not drinking, but uh, dragging things into a block uh, design. Uh, those are great, uh, about the size of a marble, it costs a little bit under $50, um, but our kids love those. We have classroom sets of those, so all the kids uh, pull out uh, butcher paper on the floor and uh, uh, they draw their lines and the little robots follow the lines. So they, they love that. Um, Bluebot. Uh, Bluebot used to be called Bbot years ago and they added Bluetooth capabil capability and they changed the name of it. Uh, but those we are actually using in kindergarten and pre-kindergarten uh, classes. Uh, they come with curriculum maps and so if you're teaching a student uh, shapes or uh, uh, mapping skills, uh, different uh, uh, arithmetic concepts, things like that, uh, then there are lots of activities that go along with the Bluebot. Uh, Lego, we do. Um, we, we got these a couple of years ago. Uh, again, Blockly coding uh, doesn't take you forever to put the Legos together uh, because there are very few pieces, as you, as you can see in the, in the photo there. And then Root is brand new uh, to uh, our element, elementary school. Um, Root is actually owned by uh, Roomba, or iRobot actually, uh, who uh, they make Roomba vacuum cleaners. Um, and it's magnetic, so you can actually take the Root robot, put it on a magnetic whiteboard in your classroom in the center of the uh, robot. There's a little hole for a, a, an expo marker, and you can actually draw and uh, do artistic things on the board as you code. So students are, are loving that as well. Uh, and then new this year also is uh, our uh, cubelets. Uh, so cubelets, um, individual uh, small robotic features, instead of having to actually code, it's simply uh, putting together certain components or certain cubelets. So uh, you may have in the, uh, the upper uh, part of that uh, cubelet design right there, a, a, a light that would come on, and then you have a Wi-Fi 
uh, cubelet that you would uh, uh, put in there to actually you know uh, control the cubelets via a, a tablet or uh, a Chromebook. Uh, so again, we have those at the elementary and uh, the middle school level. Our elementary school is a K-3, so all of these activities would be appropriate in the younger grade levels. Uh, and then, you know, uh, most people have probably heard of uh, Osmo, uh, use Osmo with an iPad. A uh, little mirror attaches to the top of the, the iPad and uh, um, allows uh, anything that you do in front of the iPad to be captured uh, on the screen. Uh, so we have uh, in the picture on the left there, you can see certain letters. You can play spelling games. You see tanagrams there in Tennessee. That's a kindergarten standard uh, for mathematics. Um, and then uh, also some numbers and some, uh, uh, some dice. Uh, there that can be read by the, uh, the Osmo. And then we have coding with the Osmo too. They actually have a coding kit uh, that we, we use. Do a lot of green screening activities across the board, K-12. So it's as, it's as simple as a, a green uh, display board with some uh, green construction paper underneath it and using a $2 app uh, called Do Inc. Uh, we've, we've actually found that uh, uh, we, we do a lot of stop motion and we'll talk about that in, in a minute, but we, we found that uh, if you don't have the stop motion skills, you can still move little characters around in the green screen if you're using toys with Starbucks stirs. The little stir that they give you with the Starbucks, uh, your Starbucks drink is green and it won't be picked up by the Do Ink app if you've got it on a green background. So you can actually move move characters around and create little stories using those, uh, those stirs. So uh, don't throw those away. Uh, when you go to Starbucks, keep them in, uh, use them in your makerspace. And then we do a lot of tangible creation, uh, little crafts, perler beads, duct tape crafts, um, weaving looms, making jewelry. Uh, and th this kind of stuff can start eating into a budget. So uh, if you can get somebody who will donate these things every now and then uh, uh, to you, that, that that's great. Uh, and then this, this is new this year at the elementary school. We've had a uh, more sophisticated version of this middle school for a while, but uh, three doodler uh, pens. So if you're familiar with 3D printing, then uh, you can actually, uh, these are, are kind of low cost uh, 3D printing pens. You, it's uh, kind of like a souped up hot glue gun is, is kind of what I think of. You feed the filament into the back of it, it heats it up. The great thing about this version of three doodler, these start kits, they are designed for younger students. So the tip doesn't get hot like a hot glue gun uh, would, and it's safe for uh, younger kids um, to use. And, and then we have free play too. So a lot of Legos, a lot of Kinect sets, uh, different types of puzzles, uh, light brights, uh, kinetic sand. You know, that's the sand that's not supposed to make a mess, uh, but it, it, it still, still does, but uh, probably, probably not as bad. Uh, so students like to, to use all of that. Um, lunchbox puzzles. I thought this was a pretty cool idea. So we took some graph paper, put it in the bottom of some uh, lunch boxes that we found on sale. And um, then, then uh, we uh, cut up the puzzle pieces. So when students are using this, they can work the puzzle and then they just leave the puzzle inside the lunchbox, close the lid and you don't have a mess. You've tidied up after yourself and they just go put those back in a closet someplace. And then things like brain flakes, but you know, there's all kinds of different varieties of that out on the market. Um, modular electronics. We've really uh, tried to introduce kids to uh, uh, science standards in our makerspace. Um, so snap circuits is a low cost uh, option for that. We've used uh, several different things along the way, but a snap circuits kit, uh, can range anywhere from 50 to $100, but there could be 100 activities in a $50 kit. Uh, students can uh, um, you know, use batteries and, and, and create sound. Uh, they can uh, have motor components to all of this and uh, lots of activities, fairly easy to figure all of that out. And again, K-3 students can, can do that. Um, once we move up to the middle school, uh, you see we have kind of a, a, a bigger area. Our elementary school, by the way, they, uh, they have what they call makerspace days. So we, we still do a lot of literacy stuff in the library media center with our elementary school kids because they're young and, and really want to build those foundational skills. Uh, 
but they get behavior points and those behavior points equal makerspace days. So we found that it's totally changed the way kids act when they come to the library and media center uh, because they want those makerspace days. So once a week or so they get a makerspace day and we pull all the stuff out and we do it there at the middle school. Uh, we, we have those, uh, that area open all the time, before school, after school, all day long, and uh, lots of different things going on uh, in, in there. So a lot of video design, kids can check out GoPros. Uh, you'll see the picture uh, below the GoPro of the Padcaster. Uh, those are pretty inexpensive studio uh, tools. Come, they come with lights and microphones. Um, everything but the iPad, which snaps into the middle of the Padcaster. Uh, you can even buy caster sets for the wheels on the uh, uh, the tripod itself so students can uh, move at the same time they're interviewing uh, someone. Um, we uh, have a 38, uh, probably a 30 foot green screen uh, wall uh, painted with uh, chroma key uh, paint. Uh, um, used to buy, uh, be able to buy chroma key paint at uh, Home Depot, Lowe's. They don't have as much of that uh, now and you kind of have to go out to uh, something like B&H Photo Video. Uh, and chroma key paint will uh, cost you about $80 a gallon, but uh, we covered every bit of this. And this is probably a, a 12 foot tall space, 30 foot long with two gallons of paint. So uh, several coats uh, soaking into to concrete block right there, but it works really, really well. The thing you need to worry about when you uh, talk about uh, green screening is you want lights actually. Uh, really close to, to, to what you're doing, you're, go, you're uh, going to get uh, odd effects uh, that, that happen with green screen. Uh, a lot of stop motion animation, again, a $2 app. It's just called Stop Motion. Uh, and uh, we, we do a, a ton of that kind of thing from kids drawing on boards. Uh, I think we've actually got a video, some videos we'll, we'll, we'll share out to you uh, after the, the WebEx today. But uh, uh, take take a look at the videos that are embedded in this present uh, presentation uh, kids love this very very simple you're just taking multiple photos uh, changing things along the way you can do that from a green screen or not uh, we've had kids uh, you know produce their own miniature plays uh, with uh, with stop motion lots of ideas and integration especially into the standards in the classroom curriculum um, Bloxels game design Bloxels we, we can get those uh, for about $50 during the holidays. They're more like 30 on Amazon. They have all kinds of different kits now. Uh, but I kind of think of this when I was a kid in seventh grade and uh, eighth grade, I used to play a lot of Super Mario Brothers back in the day on classic Nintendo. So I'm, I'm 46 years old. And uh, I've always played Super Mario Brothers, you know, and, and, and think I could probably develop my own uh, uh, levels uh, to this. You know, you just take a piece of craft paper and, and, and kind of line out what you want to do. Well, Bloxels kind of works the same way. You take these little blocks and uh, you design your game board and then you take the iPad and you capture a picture of the game board and it actually, as you can see on the left right there, allows you to put your characters into the game and actually play it. And you can do up to a hundred different levels with uh, Bloxels uh, to a game. You can even create your own characters on the board Take a photo of them with the iPad and it will integrate your character into uh, the game as well. A lot of robotics, again, at the middle school, we, we, we jump up from what we were doing at the elementary school, moving into Spheros. Uh, and uh, these are the new Sphero RVRs that just came out in the middle of the screen. It looks like the little car right there. Um, they are completely uh, open as far as their programming uh, goes. So you can really take that to the limits and do a lot of different things with it. You can in, even integrate in things like Raspberry Pi, Arduinos, um, if you're familiar with those uh, circuit boards. Um, so make it more of a, a roving computer. And then uh, we started with Lego Mindstorms, but since we are a Chromebook district, we found that uh, we had to buy PCs to program our Lego Mindstorms. Uh, so we moved uh, from Lego to VEX uh, Robotics. Uh, and then again, uh, modular electronics. So we moved up from snap circuits to little bits at the middle school. Um, you know, back in the day, 20 years ago, to create something, you would have to solder all those individual components together. Little bits makes it easy on us because they are all magnetic. And we can simply, uh, as you can see on the right hand side over here, you can take an Arduino, a dimmer, a power, 
uh, switch and uh, put a bar graph to it and literally in uh, three or four clicks of magnets right there put everything together where it works. Uh, they sell lots of different uh, kits uh, and you can buy these at you know Best Buy, uh, Barnes and Noble even sells these, a lot, lot of different uh, uh, places. Uh, we uh, when I, I met with our middle school teachers when we first started doing this and, and I said, oh, you know, we, we need to create things. Uh, and they said, well, what, what do you want us to create? And, and we had just bought a 3D printer and I said, well, you know, it'd be great. Maybe let's start out with something that kids might like, uh, like cars. And they came back to me uh, a week later because, you know, I give them an idea and they always find out a way to spend my money. So mm -hmm. they, they called back over. They said, if, if we build cars, we want to race cars. So uh, we found this 38 foot Lego, der uh, this uh, derby track, and they talked me into buying that and, and really not expensive uh, at all. So it stretches uh, halfway through our library media center and kids can uh, take Lego bases and they can use the Legos in the media center to actually build cars or uh, our seventh and eighth grade students actually 3D CAD design cars and they print them out on uh, the 3D printer. Um, but it has that optical finish line and you can uh, uh, play against three other people or you can uh, uh, just uh, refine your car and see what your best time is over and over and over again. So we've still got kids who, uh, who do this a lot. Our, our teacher, one of our teachers in that area, we actually have three adults who, who work our media center at the uh, uh, middle school. Uh, the, the younger students in fourth and fifth grade, they always wanted to build Lego cars and, and race, race the teachers. So he kept winning over and over and over again. And um, one day his car hit the end of the track and it kind of flew apart. All the Lego the pieces kind of flew apart. And they realized that he was uh, packing the center of his car with padlocks and batteries and, and, and things like that. So uh, from then on out, they refused to play with him anymore. Uh, so uh, funny little story. Um, Makey Makey, again, the $50 piece of equipment allows you to do tons and tons of uh, different activities in the classroom. You plug it into the computer. It has little alligator clips that go along with it. On the right-hand side of the screen there, you see uh, two, uh, two young men who uh, took a piece of cardboard, made a uh, Mario uh, from Super Mario Brothers out of perler beads. Uh, ironed it together, put it on their board, decorated everything, and then took aluminum foil and made left, right, and down arrows. Uh, they would take uh, the alligator clips and they could connect them to the aluminum foil and then plug it into an online game and it could actually control the online game by touching the aluminum foil on the left, right, and down arrows right there. So they could actually play Super Mario Brothers with their own controller that they made. Uh, and again, $50 for the uh, the larger Mickey Mickey. I think the they have one that's uh, that's a thumb drive that you can simply plug into the side of a computer that still has the alligator clips with it for around 30. So very, very inexpensive, a lot of uh, neat things you can do with that. Anything that um, um, can conduct a current uh, from uh, uh, aluminum foil to uh, Play-Doh, you can see in the picture on the left, uh, to simply taking a pencil and drawing circles on a piece of paper and connecting the alligator clips to the graphite circles that you just drew. Uh, we have a lot of kids who like to make their own t-shirts and like to uh, uh, make their own cups and everything. So we bought a silhouette, silhouette cameo and um, so they can vinyl cut directly in the library uh, media center. Paper circuits are very, very popular. Again, you're going to spend some money there to uh, actually uh, uh, buy uh, replacement parts because kids are going to want to take their projects with them. Uh, circuit scribe. Uh, that's a pen that actually has uh, conductive ink. Uh, we tried that for a while. They're kind of expensive. And again, once kids go through your ink, you got to buy a whole new circuit scribe pen. So uh, we kind of quit doing that and, and moved on to using um, uh, copper tape in the lower left-hand corner, um, which isn't, isn't that bad as far as price goes. And then again, we have a lot of free play things like checkers and stuff like that in the, the media center. Uh, fly bricks. That's, uh, that's been kind of, uh, um, you know, new to us, uh, little Legos that you can, uh, drones that you can build and, and, and fly. Uh, PyTop uh, is a uh, programmable uh, computer uh, laptop, but as you can see, you can pull down the, the inner workings of it on the picture on the left right there, and uh, people can kind of see 
uh, what's inside and you can change those components out to make the laptop do different things. And then we're getting into fabrication and design, laser cutters. Uh, we, we've just gotten a new one of those uh, in. So uh, we're moving from just cutting up cardboard to actually working with wood and doing more refined uh, projects. And in 3D printing, uh, so we don't, we don't let our kids just uh, pull down uh, uh, files off the internet and print them. They actually have to make everything that they, they print, design it in a, a 3D CAD atmosphere. So on the right hand side right here, kind of a neat little story real quick, is we uh, um, had an assistive technology um, uh, person come into the school district who was working with, with some kids in, in the area uh, who couldn't sit upright, uh, uh, had difficulty, uh, manipulating things with their with their hands. Uh, so this is one of those little cars here on the right that you buy a toddler that's battery powered and normally they would have a uh, foot pedal inside the car but this specific child couldn't move their legs. So the kids in our makerspace actually built bracing around the axle uh, the outside of there, padded it with pool noodles so the kid could, could actually sit up straight and uh, then, I don't know if you can see, in the very center of the steering wheel right there, there's a big orange button. So the kid could move their hands enough to actually push the button. And kids designed, our, our, our seventh and eighth graders actually designed the button and then worked with our teachers and some engineers that came in to rewire the car. And now, instead of pushing the pedal, which this kid couldn't do, they can hit the button and actually activate the power for the car. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, soldering electrical components. So here again, we took that same concept and applied it to plush animals here on the right. So working with that same uh, contracted individual uh, who was coming into the school system, she had other students who they wanted to give toys to, but they couldn't, couldn't move their, their, their fingers enough to be able to push the little button to make the, the little toys uh, sing or, or do whatever they do. You, you've all seen those Valentine gifts where you push their, the, the paw on their hand and, the, and they'll sing a little tune. Uh, so we actually wire in and uh, put the same buttons there. So they can just push the button on the table and it will trigger the, uh, uh, the stuffed animal to, to activate. At the high school, uh, we kind of up the ante again and we have more uh, uh, higher level video equipment, uh, teleprompting equipment, things like that. And then we have a sound studio there in the Library Media Center as well. Students got so good at producing podcasts that the local radio station actually has them do a, uh, uh, a live podcast uh, with news and announcements for the, uh, uh, from the high school every week. And then, of course, we do 3D printing there, and we make uh, a lot of T-shirts with T-shirt presses as well. And that's kind of kind of a, an overall uh, gist of, of a lot of things that we do in the makerspace environment. But we uh, uh, we do so much more than that. Those are so many great tools, and I love hearing all the stories behind what you've done with them. Um, so obviously, all of these tools you mentioned cost can cost a lot of money. Um, how do you get funding for makerspaces? and to get uh, tools like these and move that forward? Sure, so uh, we apply for a, a lot of grants and we started out, things moved really, really slowly. And the more that we did, uh, and the more visitors we had coming into the school that kind of saw what we were doing, uh, the more interest uh, came from the community. Uh, so for example, we really le leveraged uh, uh, our uh, civic organizations in, in town. We had a local Kiwanis club and they called me up one day and they said, we know you're doing some stuff uh, at your elementary and middle and high school. We're really interested in uh, um, robotics. We went to a, con to a convention, saw uh, another Kiwanis club who was working with uh, uh, some elementary school students with, with robotics. Um, and they said, what, what kinds of things are you doing? And I listed all the different things that, uh, uh, we were doing and they said well great that that hits everything on our list that we had down now what can we do to help you further that so for the last three years um, I guess the total now over a three-year period has been about fifteen thousand dollars that they have given us just for robotics and stem initiative equipment in these areas um, local education foundation well, our teachers can apply for grants uh, through them uh, donors choose we, we've had a lot of projects funded through donors choose um, business and industry, we had we applied for a local grant and did not receive it. And because of uh, uh, some partnerships we already had with those uh, industries that I referenced earlier who were donating us things, they had some uh, um, 
grant money available. So we were able to uh, get $5,000 uh, this last year from a local industry. And then uh, Tennessee uh, just moved uh, the work that they were doing with their high school students in career technical education down to the middle school level. So we were able to get in on the ground floor of some work that uh, Department of Education was doing with Carl Perkins uh, money federally, and we got a $10,000 grant this year through them. So a lot of opportunities out there for, uh, for this kind of stuff. You just have to dream up the ideas, uh, what you want to do. Um, that's great. It sounds like you've been very successful in getting funding. Um, how have your maker spaces evolved over time since you mentioned that you've had them um, at your school for a while? Sure. So we used to be very traditional in our library environments. Like I said, um, we started with, uh, you know, low cost items, the perler beads, using a lot of duct tape, a lot of, a lot of cardboard activities. Um, and, and, and since then, we've kind of moved from off the shelf items, even things like robotics and stuff like that, that you could just simply go out and buy to more fabrication tools. We really wanted to stretch how students were thinking, how they were creating, uh, and uh, even going out and doing industry tours, you know, to see, see what kinds of things are happening in our local industries. Uh, are we moving more from production lines to robotics, you know, in, in, in warehousing and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, so it's, it's been encouraging to see how things ha have evolved. Um, we, we also combined teachers and started thinking about things different, a, a different way. So at our middle school, we had an integrated technology class, and then we had a library media center, and then I had a technician who was serving as a help desk uh, person there. So we combined all three of those people in this one environment at the middle school, and now they all help kids dream up new ideas. So even, even combining your resources as far as personnel. That's awesome. Um, so then how do you collaborate with teachers and infuse the curriculum standards into the maker space? So we really try to take that very seriously. And we know that, uh, uh, you know, we, we need to be supportive of, of what teachers are doing in the core level classroom. So uh, my makerspace teachers, they meet with uh, those teachers on a regular basis. And just to find out, well, you know, what types of uh, uh, projects are you doing in the English language arts classroom or the math classroom? Uh, some of the things that we've had come out of that is that we had a seventh grade math teacher who said it was very, very difficult for her to teach scale. So that students just couldn't understand that when you, when you have something that, that, that this big and, and how you scale it down proportionally, you know, uh, to be much, much smaller. So they actually used Tinkercad in the seventh grade math classrooms with the help of uh, our STEAM teachers at the middle school to uh, create scale designs of robots and then they went down and they printed them off on the 3D printer where they could see them as a tangible object. Um, we have, uh, uh, we use expeditionary learning as our English language arts curriculum and there's, there are projects built within that uh, which are hands-on uh, where students actually develop uh, uh, public service announcements and we do all of that through green screening. Uh, now, so students actually come in the library and we actually take part in that project with the teachers. Um, and then, uh, like I said, blue bots, you know, uh, having curriculum at the elementary school level. So anytime we can find a tie in, we really try to do that. That's great that you really tie it all together with the maker spaces. Um, so I think that's everything that we wanted to discuss today. Um, it doesn't look like we've received any questions throughout the webinar, so I think we might close it out. Um, thank you everyone who came uh, for listening in on this. Um, we hope you learned something. If you weren't able to make it, we're going to make a uh, recording of the webinar live to you, and we will for everyone who came to the webinar as well. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for being here and for joining us. I think this was really informative and really applies to where K-12 education is headed um, in the recent years. So I think people really learned a lot from it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll see you later. Have a great rest of your week, everyone. Bye, Chris. Bye-bye.